Stuff I found interesting. Yeah, so I tried to change the name of the segment this week, but unfortunately, Chad wouldn't let me in. It is stuff I found interesting. And uh, what I wanted to chat about today, Chad, was a fascinating article I read from one of my favorite writers, a guy by the name of Scott Alexander. And he writes on a, on a blog called Slate Star Codex. Okay. And uh, for anyone who's looking it up, it's, it's a very difficult blog to read. He's a very, very smart guy, and the articles are crazy technical sometimes, so bear with me here. But this particular article, I think, is, is more relevant for a wider audience, and I think it's a very important one. And it's talking about the idea of paywalled articles. Now, Chad, I know that you know this because when we go looking for news stories for this podcast, <laughs> we often come across these stories where the yep. headline grabs us. We click that headline and then it gets there and it's like, the Wall Street Journal would like you to pay $19 a month to access this article. <laughs> and uh, I don't know about you, but I get very frustrated by those yep. because uh, obviously the, 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 the title makes you curious. You want to figure out what's going on. But then I'm not willing to pay $19 a month for it. Yeah. And I think that this is a, a, a trend we're continuing to see as people start to fight against the advertising-based model, right? Traditionally, all these sites would have lots of ads all over their site, and that's how they would fund their journalism. But with these days, with lots of ad blockers in place, people can kind of hide those ads, and the ads aren't working as well as they used to. Sites are looking for other ways to get their revenue. So sometimes they go to subscription models where they're saying, cool, if you pay the New York Times 8 or $9 a month, you can read all of their stuff, and you log in with your account, and then you have full access. Sometimes they have a bunch of free articles so you say you have five free articles a month and then after that you have to pay a certain amount to get them yep. sometimes it's certain articles are free certain articles are paywalled it's all very confusing <laughs> and what is frustrating is that there are lots of problems with the system that we haven't figured out yet. And so what this article goes into is talking about some of those problems and why we need to kind of fix this model because it's not working for anybody. I don't think it's a good experience for the user yep. and at the same time it's, I don't think it's a good experience for the actual journalist either. And that's what this article kind of talks about. So what I thought we'd do, Chad, is go through his three problems and then talk about our thoughts on each. The first one is kind of something I've already alluded to, and that's the idea of clickbait, right? Headlines are always clickbaity. Anyone who uses the internet in today's age understands that, that notion because it's yep. everywhere you see, yep. right? And the idea is to make the headline as catchy as possible to then force you to click that thing and then earn the revenue on the other side. And so... I don't know about you, Chair, but I find myself sometimes you'll wake up in the morning and you'll go onto your Twitter, or onto your blogs, or onto Google, whatever, and you'll see a headline that looks fascinating, <laughs> but it's something you've never even thought about before. Definitely. Right? So it's some, some sort of random abstract thing, but the way the headline is, is, is sculpted, all of a sudden your curiosity takes hold and you're like, I need to know what happened. I need to know what happened. Even though you weren't thinking about that ever. It's like I never thought this occurred to you. Yep. And you click on you click on that that link to try and relieve that itch of curiosity. Um, and then the paywall comes up. And all of a sudden you can't relieve that itch. Yep. And there's a really there's a real frustration there because the, the curiosity was created by them with their headline. It wasn't yep. like you were looking for that information. In, in some cases, it's just, it just comes across your, your, your path and you're like, oh, I feel really curious and I want to figure that out, but I'm not willing to pay for that value. And so that clickbait nature kind of leads to a lot of inefficiencies in the system where there's information that I potentially want that I can't get access to or don't value enough to pay for, but at the same time, I wasn't looking for it in the first place. I kind of was drawn into it by clickbait. And that's an interesting debate, I think. Well, there's lots of interesting things there to, to chat about. And, and for me, the one that I wanted to, I suppose, focus on for the initial part of the discussion is really how it comes across your screen, how it cross, comes across your eyes in the first place. And I suppose if we look at, at Apple and various things that they've done, uh, looking at the news app as a good example, um, where you've got this news app that is, I suppose, given the default top part of your notification segment, really. Um, and... I suppose this is a bit of a switch in the world of news where you've kind of switched to a more RSS feed type model, I suppose, where all of these newspapers and uh, all of these news houses feed into one platform to deliver this, I guess, more balanced sense of news. But for me, it seems like they've used that as an opportunity to introduce these paywalls because previously I wouldn't have been looking at one of these services that I know has a paywall. Um, whereas now it's almost like they've been able to sneak into my cell phone, I suppose, and, and give me these interesting headlines only to let me down. Don't you think that's an interesting evolution of the news medium? It really is. And you're actually hitting one of Scott's points is, is, is the idea that we don't know what's paywalled and what's not paywalled, right? Yeah. Uh, a, a while ago, you'd understand, cool, these newspapers are paywalled and therefore I know I can just ignore those and these ones aren't and I can go to those if I want. Or I can choose to pay for the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or yeah. whatever it is. But nowadays, things are so confusing because newspapers have different policies based on different topics 
metrics and based on how yeah. recent the article is and based on a whole bunch of different things that you actually have no clue until you click on that thing whether you have to pay to read that information or not. And that is not a good user experience, especially if you click on three or four in a row and they are all paywalled and yeah. you don't realize it, right? Yeah. And so one of his kind of suggestions to try how to improve this is that people should be forced to put like a little dollar sign after the article headline if it is paywalled. And that's also very interesting because, of course, that would be hugely debatable because the whole idea of clickbait is to get you to the site yeah. and then like convince you that there's value there. And if you're able to ignore simply on those dollar signs, it'll cause a whole bunch of new chaos. But I think it's an interesting suggestion as to what the future could look like. If you knew that this article is, is valuable and, and you think it's worth it and you see the little paywall f figure, maybe you're willing to go and pay for it. But if there's something that's not that valuable to you and you kind of don't really it doesn't really going to change your life. It's just kind of a curiosity thing. You could then ignore all of those and only click on the ones where you know you can see the information. I think it's an interesting suggestion. And I suppose on the on the ethical front, it, it seems like the right thing to do. Uh, straight before clicking on that link, you can make that decision as to whether it's that headline is worth paying money for. Um, I suppose whether your curiosity on that topic is something that you're keen to cash up for. Um, so for me, it's a great suggestion. I, I, I like the suggestion, but I get your concerns as well um, on its implementation, I suppose. Um, and it really is interesting, like you say, in terms of these paywalls, because a lot of times I've opened pages, the ones that you referred to before. And on my side, I'm not a paying member. I have full access to the article. I send it to Barry. And for some reason, he's got the paywall on it. Really interesting stuff. Yeah, there's so much behind the scenes. Sometimes if you go from a social media platform, you can have a different experience to just going there from a Google search. Or sometimes, yeah. like you say, based on geography or based on time or recency, there's a whole bunch of ways they try and figure out what is the right balance between free and paid. And I understand what they're trying to do. They're trying to maximize their revenue and trying to like do the A-B testing and is it necessary to figure out how do we convince this person that this newspaper is worth paying for? Yeah. And how do we give them just enough to whet their appetite so that they want more and they're willing to pay? So I understand the business model from a user perspective when you don't have a clue as to, you don't know what's going to work you don't know which sites are going to work like you say you send links to your friends and they can't <laughs> open it it's a frustrating experience all around and yep. I think it needs to change in some way I just don't know what the solution is absolutely Barry well why don't you talk us through some of the other points you got from this article yeah so the second one is talking about echo chambers and this is something that I'm very passionate about but I've never yep. actually thought about it like this and so that's why I thought this article was really good um, basically talking about the fact that when a headline makes a bold claim Right, So it has some sort of big stat in it. For example, a coronavirus stat that is in the public interest. Right, So it makes some claims saying there's some percentage and there's a, there's a link you ought to click on to get more information. Um, if that if then that article, which is in the public interest and, and should be for the public good, is paywalled, it restricts access to only people who can actually afford it, right? Or yeah. only people who see value in that information. And so what that does is it might it might restrict people from being able to criticize or to fact check or to do some sort of research on that information that is in the public interest. So instead of someone seeing the, seeing the headline, clicking in and then like fact checking things, because they can't see the article, they just assume the headline is true. Yeah. And they're able to just run with that idea and kind of talk about that and that becomes, that becomes fact. Whereas if you were able to see the article and fact check and like look at the other side of the coin, you might be able to say that that article is not true. Yeah. And so if that's if the public square, which is kind of where public conversation happens, if there is a fee to get into that public square, it automatically reduces the size of the public square because it restricts who can actually get there, and it makes it less diverse. Right? If I am if I am a liberal and I'm paying for the New York Times, I'm not going to then going to pay for a conservative newspaper and vice versa, yeah. because I like going to going to like follow my own unique beliefs. And so there's an argument to be made that articles that are in the public interest or that have public good attached to them need to be ac need to be accessible to everybody because that's what democracy is all about. And I think that that was the initial kind of motive for the newspaper. Like the idea of the fourth estate is exactly that, that it's a public good yep. and it needs to be accessible to everybody for as low a fee as possible to ensure that we can all have these discussions. And the moment it goes behind paywalls, it contributes to the filter bubble effect that we're trying to avoid. 100%. I think you're completely correct. Uh, when you look at a headline, you don't really see the context. You don't really see how they got to that. And to, to be able to challenge assumptions, um, you obviously need to have access to the information. So I completely agree with that there. What's the next one? Yeah, so the last one is kind of an overlap of some of the stuff we've been chatting about already. And it's that idea of the inefficiency. So the frustration of clicking through five links and they are all paywalled and you have to get to the sixth link to get any actual information. <laughs> and especially when you're looking for something specific and you're like you're searching for a news story, there's being reported by everybody that really is an inefficient use of time and effort so like the author says scott alexander says that we should have some sort of 
a uh, little tag next to it on the Google search to let you know if it's paywalled or not. And Google could definitely do that because it doesn't yeah. hurt them necessarily, but it would cause a very sour taste in the publisher's mind if we were able to ignore all the paywalled articles automatically and not have a chance to even see like what they were. Um, and so lots of interesting debates here, Chad. I think paywalls are here to stay for the moment. Uh, we're all trying to figure out better economic models than the advertising-based model because it's got a lot of flaws that we're starting to uncover. Yeah. Um, but paywalls still has a long way to go. And I think that we have to learn some of these mistakes and learn some of these problems so that we can actually figure out what is a better way to move forward. Completely agree. I mean, the fact that a lot of these paywalls rely on ongoing subscriptions for me just isn't good enough. What if I could pay to see this one article what if i could pay per view if you'd like surely then i can use the article as a basis to, to gauge whether i'm actually prepared to enter into this ongoing subscription and uh, like you said barry i think even just more transparency over the methods with which they use to choose who gets to see that paywall and who doesn't at least we're all then on a level playing field and we know what we're in for Definitely. Just one last thing I want to jump on that point you made, which is brilliant, is that the idea of paying per article. I think that one of the one of the key use cases for cryptocurrency in the very beginning was yeah. talking about that. How do you do small micro payments on the internet that can then reward individual writers? Definitely. So for example, you might want to support the whole New York Times, but you might want to support individual writers or contributors. In the same way that we're looking to to kind of support and, and, and contribute to, to creators who are creating on YouTube or on blogs, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, these kind of micro payments might be the future of this where you're able to say cool i'm willing to spend a little bit of money for for this particular article for this particular time in my yeah, life yeah. and i don't have to spend nine dollars a month for everything the new york times writes maybe it's only just one thing and i want to contribute in this small way if we can get that sort of ecosystem going and that sort of structure going that to me seems like a much more kind of capable and much more reliable and sustainable way moving forward that still is away from ads but actually supports the right work and that creates kind of a marketplace for for writers and for ideas where we support the writers that really make a difference completely completely agree and that's a great use case of blockchain technology i suppose where the hurdle for these types of transactions for the recipient is the amount of fees that's going to be cut off of processing that transaction and i suppose when you look at blockchain you know ultimately you get that to a really negligible level one of the other things things with that is you get to spend the same amount of money that you would have on a blanket subscriptions um, where instead of somebody else choosing what kind of comes into that subscription you get to pick and choose the things that speak to you over the different platforms like you mentioned youtube you could be on an article a blog you could be on a podcast and, and really just contributing um, in, in that way and i think that is definitely a fascinating uh, case study and maybe something you need to get working on barry <laughs> definitely chad i think that micro payments is a very fascinating space yeah. especially in fintech i've seen a lot of companies around the world working on this idea it's certainly not a new idea yeah, yeah. but like you say it's very difficult to change the mindset of the consumer one of the things that one of the hurdles we have to jump over is that we get we've gotten so used to getting things for free we've gotten so used to watching tons of videos and reading tons of stuff for free and we have to start getting the consumers to realize that these things actually cost money to create yeah. and to produce and if we want sustainable uh, creations from these people we very talented writers and creators and videographers etc we have to be able to support them to do what they do exactly. and this might be a way like you say to do it so instead of paying a huge amount I can pick and choose and only support the creators that I actually care about and the rest can be supported by their own audiences instead of subsidizing the whole New York Times because I want to support one author or yep. one columnist I can then pick and choose and really be more specific with how I value that stuff and so I think it's a very positive step forward if we can get that right technically it's a bit challenging but there's a lot of people working on it and so I look forward to seeing the, the innovation in that space me too let's then move on to our next segment <laughs> Across the pond. 